All right, the mate you've all been waiting for, we get to go inside IS-7. And I almost kill myself while I'm doing it. I'm really excited. Well, now I've been very self-disciplined. This is the first time I have ever actually set my eyes inside this tank. Well, Commander seems to be well seated. Um, uh, he's got nothing to his front, uh, so he's not crowded. It's not like a lot of vehicles where the gunner is to his front crowding his knees. Um, although my first observation is that there is no turret basket. There is a floor, a platform, so uh, the legs are going to be okay. But unless they have been removed from the vehicle, or maybe they were only going to be added post uh, in the main production series, there's no safety cages to prevent your legs from getting caught, uh, basically by the turret monster. If you're not familiar with the turret monster, the turret monster is a mythical creature that lives inside the tank and as the turret is traversing it tends to grab things and keep them for himself. Usually things that you need like a pen or your compass or you know, whatever it is, you know, your codes for the radio. Uh, but it is not adverse to grabbing bits of your body as well if it wants. But I digress. Uh, to its front, I can see that there's uh, ammunition stowage, it looks like for the 14.5 millimeter and further forward, uh, one of the 7.62s. Looks like control box for the intercom. Uh, visibility out. Uh, he's got a number of, let's see, one, two, three uh, of these square vision prisms. Uh, they're not as elongated, you don't get as wide a field of vision as you would expect on most of these cupolas, but really his primary form of external vision is going to be in the, uh, in the hatch, which rotates around easily enough. So the fact that these are fairly small I don't think is a huge issue. Uh, looking behind him, uh, looks like he's got ammunition directly to his rear so he can't go back too far. As long as he keeps his legs in place, he's comfortable. Not really much else to say, so I'm going to go back and see what the loaders play with. So I've now moved back to one of the two loader seats, and from a brief glimpse, it looks like the two seats are pretty much identical. Uh, I say seat, I'm not actually seated on his seat. It's been dismantled, it's on the floor. I'm currently sitting on one of the panniers, it looks like, for a projectile uh, charge. The loader is going to be a little bit cramped, uh, however, if he's seated, I'm fairly sure that it's not going to be too much of an issue. Extra ammunition is stowed pretty much anywhere it'll fit, it looks like. Uh, you can see from the inside the curvature of the armor plate that I was mentioning, and there's ammunition racks on top of that curve facing outwards, shall we say, into the nooks. Uh, there's an additional, it looks like four rounds are stowed vertically around the commander's seat. Uh, and uh, there's additional stowage, it looks like, in the front hull, which I can see from here. Outside of that, of course, he has uh, the large hatch above him, which he shares with the other loader. On the right, he has a dome light. And if you look forward, there's the ventilator housing on top of the gun breech. Now, uh, looking, of course, everybody's familiar with the concept of this isn't a standard human loader, and that is correct. It looks like it is an assisted loading mechanism. So you start off with six rounds in the carousel, seven if you clever one in the tube. Uh, you fire your round, boom, a semi-automatic breech block drops open. The shell casing comes out, ricochets against this little curved piece down here out of the way you are now able to ram the next round in. So, first thing you'll do is you'll move the projectile over. It just drops right onto the conveyor, starts getting chained forward. Then your next step is gonna be the large propellant case. Again, gets thrown onto the ramp, thrown forwards, at which point, once the uh, propellant and projectile are more or less in the breach area, this will fold up out of the way the top of this more or less parallel with the roof. Now, you'll see that the conveyor belt does not actually go all the way into the breach. Now, there is reference to a ramming button and rammer, which I actually can't find. Uh, but if they go down, it looks like, and again, I'm guessing here, 
The two loaders will have to get a ramming staff, a sort of a T-shaped ramming staff, both of them together pulling forward the projectile and charge all the way into the breach, at which point the breach block will come up and seal the chamber. Finish the ramming process, stay clear, boom, do it again, and that's your six rounds, seven rounds fired. And then you have to set about replenishing the, uh, the carousel. Uh, again, I'm not sitting on a loader seat, I'm actually sitting on a pannier for a propellant charge. Uh, I can only imagine that if I was on a loader seat, it would be even more cramped. And I'm looking around trying to see how I would actually extricate, especially projectiles, because 130 millimeters so are not going to be small, from either the turret or the gunner seat. And the gunner actually has to get up in order to access the ones that are around the gunner seat. Uh, actually, a neat feature, it's, there's a cutout in the gunner seat and it spins around to get at whichever projectile you're looking for. Uh, any case, bottom line, uh, it seems unreasonable to expect the loader to grab rounds from around the vehicle and shove them into the carousel in the middle of fighting. Uh, so it looks like you do whatever engagement is going on, you fire your three to five rounds, most likely. It's unlikely you need all seven. Uh, at which point there is a lull in the fighting. You can then replenish your six ready rounds and you're good for the next engagement. Uh, other features on the left side, he does have an elevation quadrant for indirect fire. It's got a little spirit level on it. And I note that he also has the turret traverse travel lock. Gunner seat next. All right, the gunner seat is a little bit cramped. Uh, the big problem with it is the elevation, for, uh, the manual elevation control. It's, it's frankly in my way. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if a shorter person would or would not be able to fit comfortably in here. Uh, primary controls are going to be familiar to modern tankers. Uh, looks like these are little palm switches to activate the system. Uh, elevation, as you would expect, it's a tilt system. And traverse, again, as you would expect, you rotate left or right. Uh, point to note, it is different between Soviet designs and most Western designs where traverse is actually done like a steering wheel. Further to his left, he has a manual drive uh, for traversing left or right. Uh, optics, he has a primary sight, which will be here if you put its forehead to it. Uh, that would be obviously used for the main gun and coaxials, plural. Uh, he also has two more of these small little periscopes, similar to the commander's side. Now what he doesn't have right now is a gen general vision optic. My suspect that one would have gone here. Uh, Perhaps this was a feature designed later for not prototype vehicles. Uh, that, at that point, it would actually put it in. Uh, I only hope so, because otherwise the gunner is basically blind. Uh, his situational awareness target acquisition is going to be uh, seriously limited. His toys to his right. The big gun is the 130mm S70. It is basically a conversion off of a naval gun. Uh, fired an AP round about 33 kilos at about 900 meters a second. And of course, the HE at 130 millimeters is pretty useful as well. Rate of fire stated to be six to eight rounds a minute. I firmly believe that for a minute. Uh, however, once those uh, initial rounds are gone, uh, it's going to take you a lot longer to simply reload the carousel uh, than it will take you to fire them. The 14.5 in here, it does look like it's been dismounted and it's just been kind of put in haphazardly to, to look the part. Uh, there, if there is a cradle or a mounting system, it is not on this tank. Similarly, the two other coaxials, uh, both of them 7.62 millimeter SG4, uh, SGS 43s, uh, they are not mounted on this vehicle either. When firing, uh, of course, the electrical triggers are used with the index finger. Uh, the gun does reset to a reload position, as you would expect, because of the conveyor belt system. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how that would work with, ele uh, with manual elevation. Uh, I can only assume that you have to physically crank it into place, or the loaders actually do a little bit extra duty putting the projectile and the shell into position. The hatch rotates around on the pivot here, and you can see the cog system for actually raising and lowering it to seal it into position. More electronics on its left, I've no clue. Knobs, switches, I'm sure they're useful. 
Um, unfortunately, if you want to know what they do, you can have to ask somebody else. I don't know. Well, that's it for the inside of the turret. And uh, next stop, driver's hole. So moved forward to the driver's hole, and I might actually be able to drive this one. It's a little bit difficult to be absolutely sure because the clutch pedal on the left is in serious need of calibration. Uh, but if it's down more or less where the accelerator would be, I think I could reasonably uh, control the vehicle. Uh, the seat, of course, is in the full bottom position. My big complaint about the seat is, frankly, the cushion is about this thin and you may as well not have it. So I can imagine it being a little bit uncomfortable for long periods of time unless you bring your own pillow in. Not a big concern. For visibility, he has the three periscopes, one in each side of the hull roof. And of course, you have the central one in the uh, swing hatch. Uh, moving at the left, or starting at the left and working around, ammunition stowage for the 130mm. There is a rack for the batteries. Uh, obviously, the batteries are not here, but you can see the cables for where the battery will go. Um, instrument panel. Simple instrument panel, no great surprises. Uh, although the speedometer on the far right there is that strange sort of ball system which I'd only ever seen before on the BT. Master power, direct front between the legs, looks like a nice starter button right in the middle. And of course you can't forget the horn. As you continue moving to your right, compressed air cylinders for the uh, reserve air starting system. So really cold or whatever, you can get the engine to start, pull the valve, engine starts. Eight speed selector. Uh, earlier vehicles had the six, this particular IS-7 has the eight speed. Uh, simply start at one and work your way up. Uh, the right hand side handle, reverse is to the front and forwards is you pull it back. It sure makes sense. Lots of fire extinguishers on the right. Uh, the big piston for the driver's hood and a hand throttle for the accelerator. Not much else in here. Uh, there's a couple of stowage compartments for you know, small stuff, bulbs, first aid kit, what have you. And it looks like coaxial ammunition can be back here. Uh, the vehicle carried about two and a half thousand rounds of 7.62 and a total of about 400 to 14.5. Steering, of course, done by the tillers. Tillers also perform as the brake, as evidence A, by the lack of a brake pedal, and B, you also have the locking button at the top and the notches at the bottom to, to serve as your parking brake. Uh, steering is geared, but you cannot neutral steer in this vehicle, so. Sorry, but still at least it's easier to drive than the clutch brake. The gearbox and engine together were good enough that this 60 plus ton vehicle will go along at a reasonable 60 kilometers an hour. Not a bad clip. So all in all, um, not too bad. Vision is reasonable. You got the three ports, two on the whole roof, and one, of course, in the hatch itself. It's got a fair bit of room. I'll give this one a passing grade. Well, that was a fairly informative look, and I know I learned a couple of things crawling around inside it. The vehicle, of course, never did enter service. They built the six prototypes, and then there was a very small pre-production batch built, and then they canceled the whole thing. And if you look at the vehicle critically, you can kind of see why. Okay, let's dispense with the machine gun silliness. I mean, this thing probably stand to lose five of them. And I'm sure by the time you entered series production, somebody with a bit of cop on would have figured it out and they'd dispense with them. What you had left was an excellent breakthrough vehicle. It was fast enough for the assault, easily heavily armored enough, and with the burst fire capability, quite devastating. The catch though was that this was an expensive, heavy vehicle, and that was all it was good at. T-10 was perhaps a little bit better suited for the longer battles and longer warfare that you might expect. And of course, it was also a little bit cheaper, uh, certainly easier to transport. So combine all those features together, maybe they were right to go with the T-10 series. And I suspect they probably were. So overall, fascinating technological achievement, and it's a good thing that they preserved it for us today. So that said, as ever, hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you on the next one.